Hey Broncos country, this week's episode of Broncos Weekend was recorded before we received the tragic news of Demarius Thomas's passing. DT was beloved by everyone he knew here in Denver, whether you were a coach, a teammate, a staff member, or someone touched through his generosity and extensive charity work. We will continue to remember Demarius in the coming days and weeks, and our hearts go out to his family in Georgia, his countless friends across the NFL community, and all those who held him close. We love you, and we miss you, DT. A playoff mindset has arrived in Denver after a tough loss in Kansas City. But with the standing still holding some hope, Denver begins the final five games with a must-win matchup against Detroit. We'll look at why Denver might jumpstart their passing game in a big way this week, Pat Sertan's place in Broncos history, and we'll look at why Steve Atwater might have earned himself an Emmy nomination this week while surprising one Bronco with a prestigious nomination. Welcome in to Broncos Weekend, everybody. I'm Matt Boyer alongside Alexis Perry and the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater. Guys, oh, yeah. Kareem Jackson said it on Sunday. It's must-win time. These next five games are playoff games, and while most people might be looking past the 1-10 and 1 Detroit Lions, they roll into town with the NFC Offensive Player of the Week at quarterback as we look at the quarterback matchup this week. Jared Goff and Teddy Bridgewater. AP, Vic Fangio said it this week. The Broncos need to do a better job of marrying the run game and the passing game. In your mind, what type of changes could we see from Teddy this week to make that happen? Well, given the fact that Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Jerry Judy, and Noah Fant combined for just 11 catches against the Chiefs on Sunday, I think it's safe to say that we need to see more play action from Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy has only used play action 91 times this entire season in comparison to 288 straight dropbacks. Now that defenses have to respect Denver's ground game, the Broncos absolutely have to take advantage of this. Now, Javante Williams rushing for over 100 yards is great news for all of Denver's weapons given the fact that that kind of smash mouth ground game it really occupies a lot of resources on defense. It creates one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside and some space in the seams as these linebackers and safeties have to push up in order to help with the run game. So I think we need to see more play action this week. And also, what about the bubble screen? I what like about it. the bubble screen? Do you like <laughs> that? Like, I feel like we have not seen that very much this year, and I would love to see Pat Shermer call a few more of those this week against the Lions. The opportunities are going to be there. Last week, the Lions gave up 340 yards in the air to yep. the Vikings, so maybe that run action, maybe that play action will be there for the, for the Broncos. Steve, Detroit's offense, particularly the passing game, it's not been strong, but Jared Goff, as we mentioned, the NFC Offensive Player of the Week, and he led a remarkable comeback against the Vikings. So what does Goff do well that Denver will need to account for? Well, I think more than anything, Jared Goff does a great job of throwing that short pass. One to 10 yard passes, he loves that. 51%, 51.6% of his passes are one to 10 yards deep. That's a lot. That's a ton. Um, and you know, he, he's, he's fairly accurate at it as well. Uh, I think he's 12th in the, in the league in terms of his completion percentage. Guess who's number one in the short passes? Teddy Bridgewater? Teddy Bridgewater. There we go. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, one of the things we have to do is be aware of that. And when we're go dropping back in our zone coverage is, you know, not getting too deep when our linebackers don't get enough depth. I think that may help this this week uh, because uh, he'll be they'll be in position to tackle the guys once they catch those short passes. The last time Goff played at Empower Field, he was 14 and 28, 201 yards, one INT, but five sacks. Bradley Chubb got him three times. Hopefully that's a good sign for the Broncos defense. But this time. He's going to be bringing in the NFC's top tight end in TJ Hawkinson as we look at the offensive targets for both the Broncos and the Lions, Jerry Judy and TJ Hawkinson. AP, Judy was the top wideout last week for the Broncos, but this is a team that has struggled to find the wide receivers. A lot's been made about Judy not having a touchdown reception so right. far this season. 
Even though he missed six weeks with the ankle injury, are we making too big a deal about this? Does he need to become more a focal point of the offense in your mind? I think the bigger deal is why hasn't he seen the end zone this year? I think some of this is on Pat Shermer to call the plays to get him involved. And some of this is also on Teddy Bridgewater to find him when he is wide open. Unlike last year, drops are not an issue for Jerry Judy. He's only dropped one and 36 targets. So there's no reason not to go to him. I think we can kind of think back to the preseason Teddy Bridgewater and Jerry Judy. They had some great chemistry, but unfortunately with that ankle injury coming week one, we weren't really able to see that mature and develop. So I do think over these final five games, given the fact that he's only played five games this season, he's going to start to find his rhythm. He's going to start to reestablish himself in the offense. But I also mentioned, like I said earlier, the, the play action that creates one on one matchups. And when Jerry Judy is one on one, he's open. So go to him. Detroit, Detroit secondary too. They're giving up over eight yards per attempt. So if you do get Jerry Judy one on one, probably going to be open. Oh he, he, yeah, he's, open. he's always open when he's one on one. Yeah. Steve, on the other side, T.J. Hawkinson. He's a Pro Bowler, Detroit's leading pass catcher, and the Broncos, as we've talked about, they've struggled to cover tight ends at certain points. Not last week against KC, yeah. but at certain points for sure. So how do the Broncos scheme for a guy like Hawkinson? Well, I don't know if we really would have to scheme against TJ Hawkinson. It's not like he has a ton of targets right now. I think he's averaging seven targets a game, only five catches a game. I mean, that's pretty good for yeah. a tight end, uh, and but less than 50 yards. So uh, I don't think that's a person who you're going to make a whole game plan around. But we got to be aware of the fact that in clutch situations, Jared Goff will throw the ball to TJ Hawkinson, and he's a very, uh, very good tight end. I think, uh, and just, especially in terms of catching and running with the ball. Good, really good hands. Credit to, as we mentioned, the Broncos linebackers, Kenny Young, Baron Browning, they've done a good job on those tight ends in recent weeks like Kelsey and Waller. And mind you, uh, both he and Noah Fant came out the same year. They were teammates at Iowa. And, man, you look at their stats, they're really, really similar. So uh, I, I imagine they'll have a little bit of a, a battle going on trying to uh, outdo each other in this game. <laughs> The running backs, Alexis, are also going to be trying to outdo each other. We've got yeah. Williams versus Williams, no relation. However, let's take a look at those running backs, Javante Williams and Jamal Williams. Last week, AP, Javante became the first Broncos rookie to record 100 rush yards and 75 receiving yards in a game in Detroit, bottom third of the league in run defense. So is getting the ball to Javante going to be important? Is this setting up for a big Javante Williams breakout game that everybody in Broncos country wants to see? Well, Matt, I think if you and I were watching the same game on Sunday, that was the breakout game for Javante Williams. Broncos country hasn't seen it in person at Empower Field yet. That's okay. all I'm saying. Right. Fair enough. 29 touches on the biggest stage on the road in the NFL's famed stadium, Arrowhead Stadium. I mean, that was a huge game for Javante Williams. But yeah, like you mentioned, Broncos country, they're going to be itching to see this at home. So in theory, like we've talked about, the Lions defense should pose no threat to Javante Williams this week. But in order to ensure that that actually happens they need to stay disciplined with the run game they need to keep Javante's involvement really consistent throughout the entire game they have to maintain that balance like I was talking about earlier these are all important things against any opponent but especially against the Lions I think they could take advantage of a slightly slightly weaker defense this week so could Javante have another 100 on the ground and 50 through the air I definitely think he could I think he could do that any week really against any opponent so it's up to the Broncos to execute keep moving the sticks and put him in a position to shine like he did last week it might be interesting to Melvin Gordon practice this week Mike Boone also very much a part of the offense for the Broncos last week so we'll see how those pieces interplay with uh, Javante Williams's touches this week Steve Denver gave up 89 rush yards to the Chiefs last week, which was okay, but unlike Casey, Detroit really relies on their running attack. So DeAndre Swift battling a shoulder injury. Yeah. Jam Jamal Williams, though, a very solid back. Based on what you've seen from these teams, though, will the rushing battle impact who wins this game and, and how much? Well, I, I think that's going to be a big part of it. I think both offenses are similar. They're both trying to do the same thing. That is establish the run. Whichever team is able to do that, obviously, will have a little bit of an upper hand. But I think an equally important key will be who can get the passing game going, who, who can get the receivers going. Can we get Jerry Judy, uh, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick involved in the passing game? And those guys feel like they, they're, they're, they're having an input, too. I think that's equally as important uh, as the run game this week. And uh, I think whichever team is able to do that, uh, we'll be able to come out on the other side of this thing uh, with the W. We've got to take a quick break, but when we come back 
on Broncos weekend. There have been some pretty impressive performances against the Lions in Broncos history, including one of the most dominant defensive showings in team history. We'll relive that moment next. Thanks to their NFC AFC dynamic, Detroit and Denver have only met 13 times in their shared history, with the Broncos holding an 8 to 5 advantage all time. Denver's first win over the Lions came during Detroit's annual Thanksgiving Day game in 1974. That day, Otis Armstrong ran for 144 yards and a score, while John Keyworth added two touchdowns of his own, with Denver edging Detroit 31 to 27. This series has also seen records that have managed to stand the test of time. In 1984, Denver recorded a franchise record 10 takeaways against the Lions, which included seven interceptions. Defensive touchdowns from Rulon Jones and Ken Woodward helped seal the deal in the Silver Dome as the Broncos left Detroit with an emphatic 28-7 win. In more recent meetings, Denver has won two straight against the Lions, dating back to 2015. That year, Peyton Manning threw for 324 yards and two scores against Detroit, including this 45-yarder to Demarius Thomas. Deep right, he's got Demarius Thomas there. Thomas goes up, makes the catch, keeps his balance, backpedals into the end zone. Touchdown, Denver! The Broncos would go on to beat the Lions by a final score of 24 to 12. And in their most recent meeting. And it's Deshaun Hamilton, knifing in! Drew Locke led a fourth quarter comeback with a touchdown toss to Deshaun Hamilton. In a 27-yard TD run from Phillip Lindsay put the game out of reach as Denver held on for a 27-17 victory. It's 2015, Lindsay inside the 10, high steps inside the five, touchdown Denver! We've always known that defense is a hallmark of this franchise, but 10 takeaways is still an eye-popping statistic. Welcome into Broncos weekend, everybody. Okay, Steve, you only had one career game against the Lions. You played him on Thanksgiving Day, 1990. It was a loss. Barry's, I remember that too well. He, Barry, Barry Sanders Sand ran for 144 yards on you guys. He juked me out twice on one play. Twice? I missed him twice on one play. Oh, man. Well, we won't spend too much time on yeah, that game, okay? Yeah, so, yeah. But when you were a memory. player, I, I'm curious because this is a dynamic that we see every single year. You play teams that you don't play a lot. So, did you like playing the Vikings, the Bears, the Lions, teams that you only saw maybe once every four years? Yeah, I did. I got a chance to see like how we really stacked up against other teams in the league and, you know, be other guys, you know, newer guys that come into the league. You don't play against them and all of a sudden this one year you get a chance to play against them. You've been watching for two or three years. Uh, that was always exciting. Uh, you know, other than that, I wouldn't get a chance to see the guys unless uh, we were we made it to Hawaii and got a chance to meet up at the Pro Bowl. <laughs> Speaking of rare sights, Steve. Very rarely have we seen a rookie put the type of performance together that Pat Sertan II is putting together right now. In fact, we haven't seen his interception number since 1973. Wow. Last week, Sertan became the first Broncos rookie since Calvin Jones in 73 with four interceptions in his first season. A pick this week, Steve, against the Lions would make him the first Broncos since Champ Bailey in 2006 with three straight games with a pick. So, how much do you think teams will continue to attack Sertan's side of the field because we saw it a lot in the beginning and now it's starting to, <laughs> to scale back a little bit. Hey, well, I'll tell you what, I, I believe a lot of offenses look and see, all right, which cornerbacks are effective, which ones are getting interceptions, which ones can cover really good. And if you look at the tape on Pat Sertan, he's solid in each and one of those areas. Uh, you know, he, he's good at the line of scrimmage in terms of getting his position on the receiver, uh, staying inside out if he, if, he, if he doesn't have any help or staying outside in if he does have help. Uh, and he's, he's physical at the line of scrimmage, and he's, he's got the quickness, man. He, he's, he's really playing at a high level. Uh, I can't say that it's super surprising, uh, but, you know, we kind of saw it in training camp, just how, how nifty he was, how, how great he was with his feet and his eyes. But he, he's proven it on the big stage every single week, going out there being consistent, and uh, that, that's helping this, this defense be, be good. Sertan tied Justin Simmons this week for the team lead interception, Steve. And speaking of Justin Simmons... You already know what I'm going to ask you about. Oh, man. An acting performance no. for the ages, sir, for the Walter Payton Man of the Year uh, surprise for Justin Simmons that the world yeah. saw on social media this week. How special was it for you to play a small role in that? I know, I know Justin, his play, but then the person he is means a lot yeah. to you. How special was that moment for you? Uh, it was super special. I was honored to you know, be able to help 
kind of exposed that uh, for him to surprise him with that. And, uh, you know, he, he's such a great person in addition to being a, a great player. You know, the, the guy he is as a, as, a fa as a family man, a husband and a father, and then, you know, to all the young people here in the community that, looks up, that look up to him, uh, he's the right person uh, for that, the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Uh, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to get the big one uh, but, you know, just, just to be nominated three years uh, for that is, is a huge accomplishment. And uh, my hat goes off to him because he's, he's an amazing guy. $40,000 are going to Justin Simmons' charity of choice just for being a nominee. But, Steve, as you mentioned, if he wins the big one, yeah. $250,000 goes to his charity of choice. So, Justin Simmons, congratulations. Congrats. We're, we're hoping for the big nomination or the big win coming up in February. We've got to take a quick break, but when we come back on Broncos Weekend, we've tossed around the must-win moniker plenty this show, but how do the Broncos ensure they leave Empower Field with a win? Alexis is getting some answers from Nick Kosmeiter after the break. Welcome back to Broncos Weekend, everybody. Despite their record, does this Lions offense pose a threat to the Broncos this weekend? And how do the Broncos fix their most glaring issues on offense? Well. For those answers and more, Alexis is chatting with our good friend Nick Kosmeiter from The Athletic. Thanks so much, Matt. Nick, the Broncos there are coming off a highly disappointing loss to the Chiefs, given the fact that this Denver defense gave them a legitimate chance to win, but the offense just couldn't hold up their end of the bargain. So what did you see was the Broncos' most glaring issue on offense, and how did they correct that by this Sunday? Yeah, the biggest issue, and it's one that's been a problem for a lot of the year, is, is finishing drives. Yep. Um, the Broncos were 4 of 14 on third down. They were one of three in the red zone, obviously had two damaging turnovers in that game that put their defense in a, in a major bind, even though the defense, as you said, played well. Yeah. Um, that's, that's been the issue. And if you're going to play this game that the Broncos are playing, this ball control style where you, you run the ball, you go on long drives, you possess the ball, you have to be able to, to finish at the end of that. And because, because they have the first part of the equation down but not the second, that's why they're not putting points on the scoreboard. And, and in order to in order to kind of get the offense on track, um, they have to find a way to be able to produce um, in those in those moments, in those red zone moments, in those third down moments. Um, and they got to start, I think, by by getting the wide receivers more involved than they have been. All right. Well, the running back, Javante Williams, he was the brightest spot for the Denver Broncos. He went off in his first start. Melvin Gordon, we're not totally sure if he's going to play this week. If he does, do you see the Broncos going back to splitting carries between those two guys, or do they kind of go with the hot hand in Williams? Yeah, I, I think they're going to stick to what they've done all year if, if Melvin Gordon is healthy, which is play them both, split their carries down the middle. You know, this plan was designed from the like almost the very start of training camp yep. um, in order to have both of these guys fresh down the stretch. You know, Melvin Gordon said, listen, if either one of us were the guy, we'd be yep. top five in the league in rushing. And I, he has a point to be made there. I think either one of them, if they were the number one guy, given how well this team has run the ball, you'd see them stats wise up there at the, the, the top of the fantasy football leaderboard, so to yeah. speak. But this is the plan they've had, and I think they're going to stick to it. Um, you know, as long as Gordon is healthy. Well, the Lions, they finally got the monkey off of their back. They're one 10 and one this season, but I don't really think that record is indicative of the kind of team that they are. So what kind of threat does Jared Goff and that Lions offense pose for this Broncos defense? Well, and it's, you know, Ed Donatel talked about this, you know, as a, a team like this, where a quarterback in Jared Goff comes over for the first time, you have a, so you have a new quarterback, you have a new coaching staff, you have a lot of new personnel. So much of this is just about the continuity that yeah. they're gaining together. And, you know, you, you mentioned it. They've had they've had close games throughout the season, particularly in the second half. You know, this back half of the season, yes. um, seemingly every week they're they're in the game. You know, they, in, within their last four, they've had a tie, a win, and, and two close losses. So, um, I, I just think you see a team that is kind of getting more comfortable. Jared Goff's getting a little bit more comfortable with the players around him, and, and you're starting to see the results. That it's a team that's going to play hard. Now, they don't do a lot of things particularly well. And, you know, th this is one of those areas where if the Broncos can kind of take them out and disrupt them a little bit, um, you know, they should still be able to assert themselves in this game, but, but Detroit's far more dangerous than the record would indicate. Well, defensively, what do you see as Detroit's biggest weakness, and how can the Broncos exploit that? You know, I, I, this is another situation where, um, you know, they have the ability to run the ball. Um, teams have been able to run uh, against Detroit consistently, and, and that's, what, that's, the, that's the identity that the Broncos have. That, that's the one thing that if they stick to it, 
they're good at. Now, again, that comes down to if you're going to play that way, um, you still got to find ways to get some explosive plays down the field. And I, I go back to it again. The wide receivers for the Broncos just haven't been a part of this, uh, the production the last few weeks, the last four or five games. They have to get those guys rolling. They have to get Cortland Sutton more involved. He only has nine catches in the last five games. Yeah. Um, that's where they're going to need to attack Detroit, too. What is one key matchup you're excited to watch for this Sunday? Well, I, I think I think the, the Broncos have a chance to really get after Jared Goff from a pass rush perspective. Vic Fangio said earlier this week, you know, we're playing well defensively. We're, we're you know, they, they have a they're doing well in the red zone. They're, they're limiting, they're limiting um, opponents' explosive plays and things like that. But they need to get more game-changing plays, he said. And he's talking you know, about coming up with some interceptions, some fumbling. But that really starts with the pressure up front. And Draymond Jones is a guy who I think could be in for a breakout game. You know, as a rookie, he had a really big game against the Lions. That kind of propelled him a little bit. Um, I would watch for him against that offensive line of Detroit to, to kind of maybe go in and you know, have a strip sack or something like that to get some momentum going early for the Broncos. Well, Justin S Simmons said this week that this is a must win game for the Denver Broncos. So what do they absolutely need to do to ensure they leave in power field with a dub on Sunday? Well, they, they have to they have to start better. I, yeah. I mean, this has been a consistent theme all year long. Once again on Sunday, you're down 10 to zero, and it and, and against any team in this league, that's just a tough hill to climb. It limits some of the things that you want to do offensively. And, and credit the Broncos, they did still stick to the game plan. They ran the ball, and that 20 play drive was was a heavy dose of Javante yeah. Williams. Um, but but that's the one thing I think you have to see. You have to see them come out, uh, start faster. Even at home, they've had a hard time at times um, getting off to a fast start. You know, they did it against the Chargers, and the, and that kind of played out the rest of the way. So. To me, they have to build that momentum early. And if they can get that going, you don't want to give a team with one win on the road this hope, right? You, don't, right. you, you, you want to kind of extinguish that as early as possible. So that's the thing to me that I'm looking for. They've got to come out early, um, you know, score on their opening drive, and, and then get a quick stop or, or vice versa. Well, as always, we love hearing your perspective, Nick. We so appreciate it. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at Nick Cosmiter and subscribe to The Athletic for all of his awesome content. All right, Matt, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Nick. Okay, Steve, this one, Detroit, they're a deeply flawed football team, but <laughs> this league is in any given Sunday league. So how are the Broncos getting it done on Sunday? Your keys? Well, uh, I'll kind of echo what some of the players have said in terms of, all right, this is a must win game along those same lines. I got one key. Okay. That one key is each and every player has to make the play when they have the opportunity to make it because you never know. Uh, I think it's maybe a close game, and if it is, any play could be the play that determines the outcome of this game. So, got to make that throw, got to make that catch, got to make that tackle, got to make that interception. You have opportunity to make the play, make the play, finish up, and uh, let's get this dub. I like it, Steve. For me, run the ball. Got to make the plays in the run okay. game because Dan Campbell said it in his presser. Detroit's. I think a little bit fearful of the way that Denver can can possess the ball. Detroit, 29th in possession. Denver's eighth in the league in possession right now. So if Denver can possess the ball, allow their secondary to get some opportunities against a desperate Detroit offense, they're coming, Game away, time. With, they're coming away with the win, Steve, on Sunday. What do you think? Right, I like that. I like that. And that, that goes right along with it. We've got to run it. Yep. Got to run it. Anyone you can break, take it to the house. Touchdown. <laughs> and we see Steve Atwater in the gold jacket next <laughs> That's week. Right. That'll do it for us on Broncos Weekend, everybody. For the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater, I'm Matt Boyer. So long, Broncos country. We will see you next week.